Hey there, Mount Olive Church. This is the very first time we have ever done online church only. You know, we're living in crazy times, unprecedented, at least in this generation. You know, usually uh, there's a senior somewhere who can say, you know, I remember the time something like this happened, but not this time. This is quite unlike anything we have ever seen. You know, uncertain times, uh, uncertain times like this can breed fear. You know, what will happen? Uh, will they shut down schools and shopping centers? And what about my job? And what about the economy and my investments? And how am I going to pay my rent? Or am I going to be able to finish my school? What about my health? or the health of others? Uh, what will happen with the coronavirus and will it go away or is it going to get worse? And will I run out of toilet paper? Ugh. And if I do, where am I going to get more? <laughs> All of these questions fill us with uncertainty because the truth is none of us fully know, especially on the toilet paper one. But this isn't the first time we haven't been able to know the future. You know, the truth is we make plans for our lives and we make plans for our futures, but moments like this, they show us exactly uh, just how fragile we really are. So I want to remind you, all of you, about the God that we serve. God is not uncertain. He's not caught off guard. He's not left wringing his hands wondering, what is he going to do? But we serve a God who knows all things. And the Apostle Paul actually tells this about God in Ephesians chapter 1 verse 11. He says that God is actually right now working all things in conformity with his will. Think about that. All things in conformity to his will. This means God not only work, uh, knows what's happening right now, he's working in and through what's happening right now. So I want to encourage you. You don't need to fear. God said this to his people, the Israelites, many, many years ago when they were facing their fears. In Isaiah 41, verse 10, he says, So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you, and I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. God's command to the people is, do not fear. His promise, I'm with you. Do not fear, I'm with you. And he will hold your hand, so take comfort in that. I would like to encourage us as a congregation to do a few things during these unprecedented times. Number one, don't fear. Rather than fear, seek God. Get in his word. In fact, I would encourage you for every minute that you read the news, why don't you spend some time, uh, spend equal amounts of time in God's word, maybe reading his word, me memorizing his word, or meditating on his word. Maybe you want to start with Isaiah 41.10. Do not fear. God is with you. He will hold your hand. Or maybe you want to memorize Ephesians chapter uh, 4, verse 6 and 7, which says, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. You know, the news feeds us. It, it feeds us fears because it focuses on us. It focuses on what's wrong, on, on our troubles, on our problems. And that can pull us away from God. The news feeds our fears, but God's word actually feeds our faith. God's word feeds our trust. Number two, so number one was don't fear. Number two, love. You know, you and I, as, as followers of Jesus, we get to be the church, the very body of Christ. Last week in my message, I said that, uh, you know, you and I are the church. The church isn't a building. Jesus isn't busy building buildings around the world. Jesus is building, uh, busy building his church, which is people. And I said something crazy. I said, you know, even if the, the church building, Mount Olive building, burnt to the ground, the church would continue to exist because the church is people. Well, the church didn't exactly burn to the ground last week, but uh, no one's here, so it's empty. But you know, the church is still alive and well because it's you. And you and I get to be the church. And I think this uh, uh, gives us, uh, the circumstances we're under, even though the, the building is empty this Sunday morning, uh, we have a great opportunity, an opportunity to be the church. Every single day, you get to be the church and the people you meet and uh, the things that you do. So regardless of the fact we're not meeting as a large group this Sunday, we get to be the church. So I want to encourage you. Would you love? The one thing Jesus told us to do as his followers was love. Love. 
You know, this past week, Phil Calloway sent this to our church. He said, you know, in The Rise of Christianity, the book, The Rise of Christianity by Rodney Stark, he traces the explosive growth of Christianity and he attributes it to the plagues in the first, second century uh, in, in Rome. And the philosophers of the time and the gods of the times, they offered the people absolutely nothing. Doctors and the privileged, as the plague was going on, they fled the cities and uh, they went to the countrysides. But you know, the Christians, they stayed. And while, you know, 5,000 or many, many thousands of people were dying every day in Rome, the Christians loved and even went so far as to die with those who were sick from the plague. And uh, during that time, between 25 and 30% of the Roman Empire was wiped out. But do you know what? Christianity grew from 8% of the population to 50% of the population in the empire. You know, often difficult times is a great opportunity for God uh, to do something significant. And that's what the Apostle Paul said earlier, as I mentioned in, in Ephesians chapter 1, that God is working uh, what he wants to accomplish. And God's given us this opportunity, a great opportunity to, to love. Love means, you know, protect those around you. So if you're sick, you know, stay away. Uh, protect those who are vulnerable and don't spread the germs and so on. But love does the opposite of fear. When fear hoards and isolates and takes uh, what it can to protect itself, love actually gives away. It reaches out. So I'm just wondering, you know, if you're healthy and you have opportunity, what ways could you reach out? In what ways could you love? Maybe it's helping the sick or picking up groceries for someone who can't go out because they are sick. Uh, maybe it's shoveling a walk. Maybe it's uh, reaching out to your neighbors in whatever way. But would you this week love, uh, go out and be the church? You know, d during a time of uncertainty and fear, uh, many more people are actually open to having conversations. One of the things we've talked about at Mount Olive here is having make it more conversations. Taking a normal conversation and just taking it a little farther, maybe turning it towards God or spiritual things. Often at times like this, when people are afraid, they're more open to have conversations. Um, I would encourage you during this time that you uh, be open to what God might be opening uh, for you to be able to share the hope that you have in Jesus. And so take those opportunities to share about the reason for the hope that you have. So rather than fear, look to God. And rather than fear, love others and share the hope that you have as you have opportunities before you. Let's take this unique, unprecedented opportunity to be the church, to rise up and show the love of Christ and share the reason for the hope that we have. Good morning, church. This is a little bit different, isn't it? Yeah, you know, um, welcome. We are glad you're here with us in your living room, um, wherever you might be. Um, it, we're, we've got a, a bunch of different things planned for you here this morning, but we thought we'd start off with a couple of songs that we would love for you to join in with us. So let's, let's sing together. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh, oh my soul. Worship his holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I worship your holy name. The sun comes up. song again whatever may 
Yeah, I want to say welcome to Mount Olive Church Online this morning as well. My name is Murray, and I'm the community life pastor here. Things are different here this morning, and um, that's what happens when we have this uh, worldwide epidemic going on, and God just wants to, I think, challenge us and cause us to flex and change and take advantage of this opportunity. There's a few things that are changing because of this. Uh, one is communication. Uh, important for you to uh, stay connected with us by going to Mount Olive EFC online uh, and you can find, just keep there, we'll keep you up to date as to what's happening at the church and with the ministries that are going on. And that's the second thing that I want to say is changing is ministries. There are some things that will be changing. Uh, for instance, this week, uh, there will be no maps uh, and there will be no seniors coffee this week. So we are having to make some adjustments uh, to our uh, ministries uh, due to the current events that are happening in our world today and right in Alberta as well. A third thing that we need to change is, um, is giving. Um, you're at home. We're here. Uh, we still need to keep things going here at the church. And so we would invite you to uh, continue to keep giving. You can do that one of two ways at the moment, you can give online through Tithely, or you can bring a check and drop it off uh, at the office during the week. We are here during the regular uh, office hours, uh, Tuesday to Friday for sure, and uh, Mondays in the mornings for sure. So those are, those are some things that are changing, and we just are so thankful that you've joined us online this morning. And, uh, but there's one thing that doesn't change, and that's our God. And I want to read a few verses from uh, Psalm 46. Psalm 46 says, God is our refuge and strength, always ready to help in times of trouble. So we will not fear. Wow, there's a lot of that around these days. Fear. We will not fear, even when the earthquakes come and the mountains crumble into the sea. Let the oceans roar and foam. Let the mountains tremble and as the waters surge. And then the end of that psalm, there's just some great encouragements for us today. Be still and know that I am God. I will be honored by every nation. I will be honored throughout the world. The Lord of the heaven's armies is here among us. God with us. The God of Israel is our fortress. Thankful for that this morning that our God never changes, 
that he, that's one of his main promises in Scripture, that he will be with us. His, his ways are true and just, it says in Psalm 33, and we can trust him this morning. We're thankful for Al, who's going to be speaking to us in a few minutes, Al Murtis, and uh, from the book of Micah. But just before we carry on, let's just pray and ask God's blessing on our time together. Father, we're thankful this morning. We're thankful that you are the God who never changes, even in these times of change, that we can still trust you, that no matter if the mountains fall, the seas roar, COVID-19 comes to our province. We do not need to fear, for you are God, the God who never changes, and your ways are true and just, and we can trust them. We thank you for that this morning. So just bless us today, Lord, as, as we are in our homes. Uh, it's different this morning for all of us. Uh, Lord, would you just speak to each one of our hearts, I pray, as Al opens your word this morning. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, let's, um, let's sing Amazing Grace together. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now was blind, but now I see. Twas grace, twas grace that taught my heart to fear, and grace my fears relieved. How precious did that grace appear, the hour I first believe my chains are gone, I've been set free, my God, my Savior has ransomed me, and like a flood, His mercy reigns, unending love, amazing promise good to me his word my hope secures he is my shield and portion as long as life endures my chains are shall soon dissolve like snow the sun forbear to shine but God who called me here below will be forever mine will be forever Please rise and stand. That's what you'd hear when you walk into a court case and then he'd say, please be seated. The judge has all the power in his hands. He can decide who's guilty, who's not guilty. He can decide the sentence and how long it will be. That's what the judge gets to do. Some of you maybe have been a part of a court case. Maybe you've been called to, to ju jury duty. Maybe you've been called to 
to be on stand yourself, uh, defending yourself. Maybe you've watched something on TV like Judge Judy, and she has all the power to cross-examine people. It is their intent to serve justice, but they are the ones that are in charge of everything. And it's not a time usually to make jokes or to make small talk with them, I discovered. A number of years ago, my wife and I were actually in an armed robbery, believe it or not. And the guy with the gun pointed it at the guy behind the counter, not at us, fortunately. But as he was there, we watched this thing take place. And then they cross-examined us, and the police came, and they talked to us, said, what did you see, who did you see, all those kinds of things happened. And to our surprise, two years later, they asked me to come, sit down in the courtroom, and swear on the Bible and say, in front of God and these witnesses, I promise to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. And so it got really serious at that point, and I thought, it's probably not a time to say, hey, Judge, how's the weather today? How you been doing? Those kind of things. He just sat there and said, sit down, give me the answers. That was his final words to me as I tried to unravel and remember what took place two years earlier. It's an intimidating setting to be in a court. And, to, and when you're sitting next to a judge, it's even more intimidating. In this passage that we're going to look at today, it actually talks about that. It's a cool passage that's found in Micah chapter 6. In Micah chapter 6, it's found kind of two-thirds of the way through your Bible. So if you have your Bibles, you can take and open them up and turn to Micah chapter 6. And you kind of get the setting that's happening in this in this book. Now, it's a short book, so you might have a hard time finding it. So take a moment to look it up. It has only seven chapters. It's not very long, but it's a message from a prophet. The prophet is there to actually bring the news of God to these people called the Israelites. If you look at it, you will see it resembles a court case quite well. It says, listen to what the Lord is saying. Stand up. State your case against me. Let the mountains and the hills be called to witness your complaints. And now, O mountains, listen to what the Lord's complaint is. He has a case against his people. He will bring charges against all of Israel. That's what the prophet is starting to tell them. So the prophet is starting to speak into their hearts and their lives and say, Look, God is angry with you. He has feelings. He is, he's has emotions. He's like, I have had enough of what you've been up to. So he says to the prophet, please go tell my people these things. Then it goes on to say, uh, here in verse 4, 3 and 4, Oh, people, what have I done? What have I done to make you tired? Answer me. I brought you out of Egypt and redeemed you from slavery. I sent Moses and Aaron and Miriam to help you. Don't you remember my people? He's bringing up something from way in the past. Literally hundreds of years before. So if you think where Canada has gone just in the last 125 or 130 years, you realize that there's generation after generation and generation had already gone by, but he says, remember what I did for your forefathers. Remember how I led them out of Egypt. I set them free. Those are points that he says, I want you to remember all that I've done for you. And sometimes I think we need that same reminder to say, what has God done in our lives how has he changed us? What has he worked upon us? But then it goes on to say, uh, do you not know how King Balak of Moab tried to have you cursed and how Balaam, son of Beor, blessed him instead? Remember that? Remember that journey? He says, so if you go back and kind of find it in Numbers, it's found in Numbers 23, that story, the story about what he's referring to here. It says, while the Israelites were camped in Achaia Grove, some of the men defiled themselves. Let's go back to 23 first. Balak summoned me to come from Aram. The king of Moab brought me from the eastern hills. Come, he said, curse Jacob for me. Come and announce Israel's doom. But how can I curse them, he says, whom God has not cursed. How can I condemn those whom the Lord has not condemned? I see them from the clifftops. I watch them from the hills. I see a people who live by themselves, set apart from other nations. Who can count Jacob's descendants as numerous as the dust? 
Who can count even the, a fourth of Israel's people? Let me die like the righteous. Let my life end like theirs. Then King Balak demanded that Balaam, who, what have you done for me? I brought you here to curse my enemies. Instead, you have blessed them. So again, he's reminding them of something that happened in the past and said, look, he tried to curse them, and yet he turned around and blessed this nation. But then just a few short chapters later in 25, which is the one I started reading earlier, it says this about what took place. And this is a sad story. The first one was a, a celebration story in a sense saying, remember the good that happened and the blessing that you received? In this one, there's more of a downside to it, and you'll see why. While the Israelites were camped in Archaea, the grove, some of the men defiled themselves by having sexual relations with the local Moabite women. These women invited them to attend sacrifices to their gods, small g. So the Israelites feasted with them and worshipped their gods, small g, in Moab. In this way, Israel joined in the worship of Baal of Beor, causing the Lord to get angry and to blaze against his people. This was another tragedy that took place, and he was angry. And it says at the bottom, in, in verse 9, it says, but not before 24,000 people died. Like it was a, a distinct time for them to remember all that had happened in this case. And so Micah reminds them of these things and says, hey, this is what's the result. Then if you look into verse 6, you'll see that things start to change a little bit more. Um, what can we bring before the Lord? The people now are sitting in the judge's chair and next to the judge and he's saying, okay, what can I do? What can I do to bring, to bring joy, to bring satisfaction back to you, God? And basically they start out with this. What kind of offering should we then give him? Should we down, bow down before God with offerings of yearling calves? Now, some of you are farmers, and some of you would realize that calves to you are very valuable. This is a calving season, and you know that that happens. But these were like one-year-old fattened calves that they would say only the priest could, do, could actually sacrifice them on burnt offerings to, to appease God. And so they're saying this is a valuable item. This is so valuable. So this, these calves of a year old, these fattened calves, uh, are also when they were burned, they were actually, the, the idea behind it was the incense of burning cattle would go to heaven and please God. And so I don't know if you've ever smelt some burning animal. It's not very pleasant. But that's what they said. This is why they would do that. So they actually said, hey, I want to sacrifice a fattened calf. Would that please you, God? And, and as you kind of see that, it's it's their first step in bargaining with God. They're saying, God, would this even, would this please you? And sometimes we, we as believers, we do the same thing. We actually try to bargain with God. We attempt to seek his forgiveness and we attempt to seek his leading and guiding by bargaining with him. And I know that I've been guilty of that as well at times. So sometimes it's like we try to strike this deal. If, if, you bail me out from this time, then I will, and you can fill in the blank. It's like, if you just get me out of this jam this one time, God, then I'll do this or that or the other thing for you. Have you ever done that? I know I have done that at times. As a student, it might kind of be like this. Uh, God, if you really bail me out on this test, I'll study harder the next time. And that's sometimes what happens. And so we go through life sometimes just going, hey God, I will do whatever it takes if you just come through for me. I will read my Bible more. I will pray more. I will treat others better. The list is kind of like endless. And we as humans, sometimes we try to strike that kind of a deal. And sometimes God answers that prayer as well. Sometimes he allows us to get away with that. Sometimes he answers that prayer and says, okay, and then the question is, how will you proceed with that? Will you follow through with that commitment that you made? 
It's pretty easy sometimes when you're on death's doorstep to make a bargain with God. Or sometimes when you're in deep trouble and you say, God, only if, if you come through for me in this one, I will come through and I will keep my word. But then sometimes we move on in life and we kind of forget about that pledge that we made to God. When's the last time you made a bargain with God? Or tried to? Ponder that for a moment. Think about when's the moment when you said, God, if you do, then I will. And you can fill in those blanks. But take a moment to think about that. It goes on in verse 7. Should we offer you then 10,000 rams or thousands of rams? Really? Thousands of rams? Or should I give you 10,000 rivers of oil? Hmm, must have been Albertans. There's lots of oil. Oil was a substance in their lives. Oil was something that was valuable to them. But 10,000 rivers of oil or 1,000 rams was impossible for them. It's called a hyperbole. It's an exaggeration. It's like saying, if I told you once, I told you a thousand times. It's an exaggeration. And they were going above and beyond what they could actually give God back, but they were saying, would that please you? Would that help you to walk through life? Would that for- help you to forgive us? I think that is sometimes what we do. We exaggerate as well. Maybe like someone today is praying, God, if you keep the coronavirus away from me and my family, I will do whatever. I will pray more. I will give more. I will read my Bible more. I will support the needy more. I will give. In fact, I'll give anything or I'll, I'll even become a missionary for some of you. It's that kind of a bargaining that they're kind of doing and saying, God, just come through for me this one time. Striking a deal with God. Striking a deal to get his favor. It's very tempting, and it's very easy to slide over to that area. But the very next verse is the ultimate. It's almost like a slap in God's face. It says this, Should we sacrifice our children to pay for our sins? Should we, tra- should we give away our very firstborn child to pay for our sins? Why was it such a slap in God's face? Because if you remember the chapter I read before in Numbers, it actually talks about Baal and the Baal worshipers of their time, they actually took their firstborn and placed it on an altar and burned it. So how many of you sitting around at home today are the oldest in your family? There might be a few. Toast, you're toast, you're gone. They took it away from you. You've been burnt on an altar. And so that's what they were saying they were willing to do. They were willing to give up your firstborn to do that. And that's what Baal worship was all about. And that's why God's anger burned so furiously against the people. was because they were trying to actually bargain with God on a very sinful act that the Baal worshipers did. And so when it gets to that verse, it really kind of climaxes the whole court case ideal. And just like... I'm sure God was furious at that point. But then, then the, the prophet Micah comes back on and says, Oh no, people, the people, he has told you what is good. And this is what he requires of you. And that is to do righteousness or just, treating others justly and fairly. That's what some translations would say, do justice. Some would say, in my Bible, is do what is right, and doing what is right is, is going out of your way sometimes to be nice to other people. Sometimes it's easier to find something like this by doing the opposite, and that's saying, like, what does justice mean? What does unjustice mean? We all know what unjustice feels like. In fact, some of you may have teenagers that have said this, these words to you. It's not fair. It's not fair. They get to stay up later. They get to go to the party. They get to do all these different things. It's not fair. And that is kind of the opposite of doing justice in a sense because you all kind of know what it is like to be mistreated and treated unfairly. But how do we go beyond that? We go beyond that by saying, 
I am going to do whatever is right, whatever it takes to do justice. I'm going to make sure that I pay my bills and my taxes. I'm going to make sure that I, I give back to others. I'm going to make sure that I treat others better than I think they should treat me. I'm going to kind of do the test at times and just say, God, what do you want me to do to treat others fairly? A good book that comes out of that is these two books here that I really recommend. One is The One Life by Scott McKnight. Because in this book, he challenges us to think about what is our one life like? How do you want to live your one life? How do you want to do justice? There's a whole chapter on justice in here. I think it really helps you. The other book that you might want to pick up and read if you're locked in your house for 14 days, The Life You Always Wanted by John Ortberg is another one that's a real good read for you along those lines. But when you think about doing justice and treating others rightly, it is going out of our way to do those things. Micah then says to love mercy, or it might be love kindness in your Bible. And in that, it kind of goes hand in hand, the two of them together. Kindness is shoveling someone's sidewalk in the snowy winter weather. It might be boosting a cold car for someone else. It might be getting groceries for the person next door because they're locked in sick. It's going out of your way to meet your neighbors and be a part of that And I think this is a prime time to do some of those things, to reach out to others and show kindness and show mercy to them. And uh, I think that can really help and go a long way. It's sometimes letting the person behind you in the grocery store go before you. Uh, They only have three items and you got a cart stuffed with stuff and saying, hey, would you like to go first? Maybe it's going through the drive-thru and paying it forward for the person behind you again. These are some days that that might be really beneficial and just lift their day up as well. So that's called paying it forward. Whatever it takes to show your kindness to others. Take some time right now to write down what you would do this week for someone else. What is one way that you can actually show mercy and kindness to others? Think about it for a moment. Take out a pen. Write it down so that you kind of remember it after today and say, this is what I want to do this week to do that. Remember, the smallest deed is worth more than the greatest intention. The smallest deed is worth more than the greatest intention. So think about that moment and let that penetrate into your heart and life. The next phrase, as he kind of wraps this thing up, is the to walk humbly with your God. And that's the hardest one of all three, probably. Because we need to move forward and allow us to walk with God each step of the way. When we face the fears and the trials in life, are you walking with God humbly? Because that's what he truly desires. He says, I don't want your calves of a year old. I don't want your exaggerations. I don't want a thousand rams. I don't want 10,000 rivers of oil. I want you. I want you to walk with me. Psalms 20, 37 says it this way. The Lord directs the steps of the godly. He delights in every detail of their lives. Though they stumble, they will never fall. For the Lord holds them by the hand. In other words, put your hand in God's hand during these troubled times. These times when everybody's facing fear. We ask that you would look at this and say, Lord, help me to walk through this time. It's tough. It's a hard time. Every time you turn on TV, every time you listen to the news these days, there's something new that's depressing almost and saying that, you know, this virus is conquering the world. And so we need to lean into God even harder during these times. There's some passages that I would challenge you throughout the week to maybe memorize or to begin to look up and read. Joshua 1.9 is a great promise. Isaiah 41.10. Deuteronomy 31.6. Matthew 28.20. Romans 8.38 and 39. Passages that will bring you comfort that God is there with us through all of life's journey. As we walk with him humbly, as we love others and show others, that's what he was challenging them to do in in Micah chapter 6. And again, I think it challenges each one of us. I want to close by reading Isaiah 41. It 
9 and 10. I have called you back from the ends of the earth, saying, You are my servant, for I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up with my victorious right hand. That's what he's desiring, to walk through this journey together. As a church, as a body of believers, as those who believe in Jesus Christ and share that with your neighbors as you go through this week. Let me close in a word of prayer. Lord, we pray for the people around this world that are walking through this crazy time, that you would calm their fears, help them to turn to you during this time, help us to reach out to those around us who need our help. Help us to treat others justly and kindly, and most of all, would we learn to walk humbly with you throughout each day as we live this life together. Amen.